Zephaniah chapter 3, I'll be reading the last half, verses 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said, Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weary. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Verse 18, I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. And at that time I will bring you in. And at that time when I gather you together... For I will make you renowned in praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and what you have done. Father, we come to you and we lay aside the burdens of this past week the struggles, the trials, the, uh, how we have been misunderstood and misled and our desires have been misconstrued. We have sinned and we have erred and we have not done what you have called us to do. And Father, we feel our need for you this morning. And we thank you. That as a good father cares for his children, you are our good father and you care for your children. You are, have sent Christ, the good shepherd, who cares for his sheep, who protects them from the wolves and the bears and the uh, attacks from the prey, predators, but also protects them from themselves. Father, we come to you today, and we confess that at times we doubt, at times we have been apathetic and lethargic, we have been distracted by the shiny things of this world, and we have not set our hearts on you, the source of eternal, everlasting, irrevocable joy. We have not trusted you or sought you, we have trusted ourselves. Father, I thank you that you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you have sent us Christ while we were yet sinners who laid down his life and calls his sheep to himself. And all who come will not be cast out. And we thank you, Jesus. In the name above all names we pray, amen. You may be seated. Uh, this morning we uh, finish up the book of Zephaniah. And uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been a lot of hard work. Uh, but I have uh, learned a great deal about the heart of God. Next week, of, of, I've mentioned earlier, we begin the book of Jude. It's the second to last book of the New Testament, right before Revelation, 25 verses. And I would encourage you, each day, read the book of Jude. And you can go to work and say, yeah, I read a whole book of the Bible. You don't have to tell them it's one of the shorter books. Um, but you can say, I did that. And that way we can know it and study it together. There will never be another day like August 14th, 1945. For the nation was fixed to their radios as President Truman, seen behind me, re read calmly to the reporters the, state, the following statements. 
I've received a message from the Japanese government of full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a fully, full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. When Truman was done, the reporter said, his uh, serious demeanor melted away and he smiled. Why? Because the war was over. And at that point, it unleashed in our nation a two-day celebration that will never be seen again. The USS Ticonderoga enlisted men burst out into song at the news that the enemy had defeated and they could go home. In New York City, oh, almost two million people celebrated for 48 hours. They danced, they sang, they shouted with joy as a ticker tape parade fell down on them as they celebrated the end of the war in both Europe and in the Pacific. In cities all around the country, like Knoxville, Tennessee, the people rejoiced and exulted with all their hearts as fireworks and confetti and impromptu parades went down Main Street. The nation sang and they shouted and they rejoiced with all their hearts because the war was finally over. This morning... Like so many years ago in our nation, we listen intently to the words of Zephaniah, who brings us the good news. Like Truman back in 1945, these words are a cause for great celebration because they are anchored in the truth of our God. And that truth is able to give us a hope that is unwavering and brings us through the storm. I want you to know this. My big idea is this. The promise of God's steadfast love, the promise of God's steadfast love in Christ is the beginning of eternal joy. The steadfast promise, or the promise of God's steadfast love in Christ is the beginning of eternal joy. And these promises that we have in, in Christ that he's telling us about is one, that we have a future without fear. We have a future without fear. We have a God who cherishes us. We have a God who cherishes us. And we have a place to belong. We have a place to belong. I'll bring in that, that, that big idea up one more time because I know some of the kids are writing it in their notebooks. And I'll leave that there as we look at our first aspect, a future without fear. This steadfast promise of God's love for us in Christ. Notice in 14 and 15 it says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. The book of Zephaniah has been honestly exhausting. This is week six of the book. Uh, the first four weeks that we went through were some of the darkest moments of judgment that was declared in the Old Testament, anywhere in Scripture. And we have trudged through this dark valley. A judgment, let me say, that was deserved and a condemnation that was just because as Zephaniah lays out as this prosecuting attorney to the people that it was their idolatry and it was their pride and it was their rebellion and violence and fraud and corruption and greed and oppression and treachery of the people, not the... Um, the people of the promised land that were driven out, the Amorites and the Canaanites and the, uh, all the other ones. This was the people of God. 
and the people of God, it was indecipherable between the pagan nations and the people of God that had received the grace of their God. Notice setting the stage for the good news is this final declaration in chapter 3, verse 8, as a review, therefore wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather the nations, not just Israel, all the nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out them my indignation, all my burning anger, for the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. These words are heavy, and these words are bitter, and quite frankly, these words are terrible. But these words are necessary. Why do you say that, Chris? Because without the burden of our condemnation, we will never appreciate the relief that we have in grace. Without the bitterness of God's wrath, this, this, this uh, promise of God's wrath, they couldn't taste the sweetness of God's mercy. Without the despair of judgment, they could not appreciate the joy of freedom. It was not until Judah had experienced the burden and the bitterness and the despair of what was coming and what they deserved through the voice of the prophet, could they recognize how wonderful Zephaniah chapter 3 really was. I had a, a friend who says, Unless, until you're street hungry, you can't appreciate the food of a friend. Before, in two and a half chapters of Zephaniah, all they could do is weep and wail and mourn in hopeless shame. But now, as they, like uh, uh, our fellow Americans, leaned into their radio to hear the voice of Truman say the unconditional surrender of our enemies, they could now, they could sing, and they could shout, and they could rejoice with all their hearts because God had taken away the judgment that stood against them. Look at verse 15, this promise of the prophet. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. That's really good news for a people that God said, I will wipe away everything. With this promise... These people clung to this promise because they knew the condemnation that they deserved, the suffering that they were going to go in because of the consequences of their sin was not the final word. Their enemies who conquered their city and were still coming, because we know that all, both the north and the south, went into exile. They were still coming, but the enemies would not um, oppress them forever. Why? Because the grace of God would intervene. The latter half of 15, the king of Israel, the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, is in your midst. And you shall never again Fear evil. In Old Testament times, the presence of a king amongst his people guaranteed their safety. He guaranteed that they would be safe for their enemies and that their needs would be provided for. And God is telling through Zephaniah, the Lord is your king. And he is in your midst. He has not retreated. He has not abdicated the throne. He has not left under the cover of darkness. He is in your midst. And he is not weak. And he is not defeated. He's mighty. He is a warrior. And he will save you. Though the battle is long and struggle, and there is still the element that God would judge these people for their sin, it was not the final answer because God was in their midst and he was doing something and therefore their future was secure because God was in their midst and they know though the process in life would be difficult, 
They did not have to fear judgment and rejection and condemnation. That was not the final word. The king would give them what they needed, when they needed it, in the amount that they needed. Therefore, they did not have to fear even though they didn't understand the circumstances of their life. They didn't understand why things were always happening to them. They did not need to fear the future because the God who loved them and was mighty was in their midst and would save them. Probably, one of the, or I should say this, one of the contemporaries of um, Zephaniah was Jeremiah. And I'm actually reading through, in my reading, Jeremiah right now. And I haven't got here yet, but you all know this verse. I know the plans I have for you. You probably have it in a mug. You have it in a t-shirt. You have posted it with flowers in the background on social media. And, but the problem is you might not have read the context of it. You're like, man, plans, I'm going to get a great job, and I'm going to have this beautiful family, and I'm going to be strong, and I'm going to win American Idol in the Super Bowl in the same year. And you're like, these are the plans God has for me. And then you read Jeremiah 29, and you're like, holy cow, context matters. And so as Zephaniah is speaking, to, oops, as Zephaniah is speaking to these people, Jeremiah is also these same people. He says, I know the plans I have for you. The plans are the Assyrians are coming, and they're going to burn down your city, and they're going to lead you into captivity. And I know those plans because it's me who's leading them. But they're not for evil. And they're for your welfare. Why? Because you're addicted to the crack of idolatry in this world. You, like Narcissus, love the reflection of yourself. And you're following all the voices of this world. And I have to break those and drive you away from those. And it will cause you to break down in tears. But you have a future, and you have a hope, because I am a God who saves, and I am mighty, and I am in your midst as your king. I will give you what you need, when you need it, and the amount that you need. And then he follows up, if you keep reading, which nobody posts this on their t-shirt, but I digress. I will be found by you. When you're sitting by the waters of Babylon in lamenting and mourning because you're held captive in a place that you didn't want to go, held under a king you don't want to be under, I will restore your fortunes. And I will gather all the nations, not just you, all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from the place which were I sent you into exile, and I will take care of you. And I will protect your future. And I will be in your midst. And you don't have to fear the future. Though you fear the process sometimes. Though you fear not knowing what's going on and what God is doing. And you question, does God really love me? He's in your midst, and there's no enemy that has overtaken you. Sin, death, or any other enemies, they cannot defeat you. Not because you're strong, not because you're mighty, not because you've got it together, because we're messy and we don't have it together, but our God does. Our mighty warrior protects us. Brothers and sisters, you don't have to fear if you belong to Jesus. Nothing in your life can remove you from the love of God and belonging to Jesus. Death or life cannot remove you. Angels or rulers, today, things today or things tomorrow, powers or authority, cancer or criticism, pandemics or politicians, they cannot remove you from the love of God. Your future is secure and you do not have to be a slave to fear because the Lord is in your midst and you can sing and you can shout and you can rejoice with all your hearts. Amen? We need, to, we need to step it up, folks. This is really good news. We are not the frozen chosen. Even though we may play one on TV, we are not. 
And we can sing, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fears are gone, even though my heart is fearful because I don't know what's coming. Because I know it's not up to me. He holds my future. And life is worth the living. Why? Because he lives. And our God, who is mighty to save, is in our midst. Amen? And the promise of God's steadfast love in Christ is the beginning of eternal joy today and for eternity. And therefore, we can face a future without fear. And then the second aspect, the second promise, the second joy that we have is a God who cherishes us. If God has uh, um, removed all of our fears or all the things because he is in control, there is no reason to be weak and listless, stoic, or fatalistic. We have reason to be strong and confident and joyful, even through tears, when we lose the joys and the blessings of good gifts from a good father. Notice verse 16. On that day... It shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. Don't let your arms be limp. Don't fall in defeat. The Lord is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. Verses 16 and 17 are probably some of the most breathtaking promises and picture of our God and the relationship our God has with us in all of Scripture. He is mighty to save and He loves mightily. Because God loves His people, He will save them. They must not be paralyzed by fear. As Kevin read for us this morning, perfect love from a perfect promise-keeping God casts out fear. This is a picture of a mighty warrior who is strong on the battlefield, who will defeat his enemies. Yet the aspect of of God we see is not a mercenary who is detached from uh, the... the people he's protecting because he wants a paycheck. This is a mighty warrior who is defending the people he loves. There's a difference. And Zephaniah is calling the faithful to bold action in the face of fear, in the face of opposition, in the face of discouragement, and in the face of doubt. They can fight with confidence. They can live with confidence. As Brian Hoffman says, putting on the full armor of God in the battle against the enemy because they have a God who fights for them and a God who loves them. Who is this king of glory, the psalmist said. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Paul in 2 Corinthians says, So the weapons of this warfare are not of the flesh. It's not our own ability, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. That mighty warrior loves us and cares for us and fights for us. And he delights in us. Verse 17, I will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. This verse is one of my favorites. This verse is what I have been working for. This verse, reading, getting to this point, was all the the football player uh, working and striving and practicing and tackling and doing all that thing just so in the Super Bowl he can run that ball over the the, the end line and score the winning touchdown. I have been waiting for this verse because it is a brilliant picture of the love of God for his people. I pray, though, that I don't fumble on the the one-yard line like, what, Ernest Biner? God does not love his people with a generic love, but with a deep, profound intimacy. He will come and save you because he loves you. 
You see, this first thing that Zephaniah declares, he rejoices over you. God delights in his people. They're precious to him. And it's this picture of a parent. And I remember the first time I was a parent, uh, the breathtaking of wonder, of holding your baby for the first time and saying, they're absolutely perfect. And then they poo, and you're like, that's the cutest thing ever. Now, that goes away really quick. It's like a grandparent. Okay, I've heard it from all of you that have grandchildren who delights in the wonderful accomplishments of their grandchild. They're so smart, like they, just like every other kid. But there's a joy that as a grandparent, I haven't got yet, but I have watched many of you just delight in that child. It's like a worker who at the end of the day looks over their work and says, that looks really good. And that feels really good. A job well done. It's a scholar delighting in a profound insight. They have studied for hours and hours and months and days, and they have found the link. And it feels good. It's the collector who brings somebody in in their beautiful collection of whether it be baseball cards or autographs or stamps or whatever you name it. And they want to show their buddy, check this out. It's the gardener who delights in their garden and pours themselves into their garden because they love it and they cherish it. These are the pictures. This word that's used throughout Scripture is the joy and the delight that God has in His people. He cherishes them. He finds joy in them. They are precious in His sight as our children sing. The love of our Father cherishes us and rejoices over us. And then it continues, he will quiet you by his love. Now, depending on the translation you have, it's differently. But I believe the best translations are not um, our quietness before God, but God's quietness over us. I like how the New American Standard translates it. He will be quiet in his love. For two and a half chapters, the judgment of God was loud and devastating. The mountain shook at the wrath of God. Now he comes to his people who he delights in, and he's quiet over them. Spurgeon said it was Jesus at the cross in his silence that loved his people so much, he was silent as he won them from their sin and their bondage. This is a deep, intimate love in which words are insufficient in the moment and later to describe. This is the profound love of a mother gazing at silence in this child that she has waited so long for, and all she can do is wonder in silence. This is the intimate silence embrace between a husband and a wife, which in that moment no words can suffice. God loves his children. He loves his people. He cherishes them. He finds joy in them. They are precious, and his love is silent as he holds them. He rejoices over them. He's quiet, he's quiet in his love. And then it says he will exalt over you with loud singing. I remember when our children were babies. We had a, a glider in the nursery. And every night, uh, my responsibility was bath time. I would clean them, uh, put them in their little pajamas with the feet, and then I would give them to Denise. And she would sit in that rocker, And she would sing to them, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name she would sing. After a long day of laughter and cheers, joys and disappointments, our babies rested secure knowing that their mother loved them as they slipped into sleep that night. This is the picture of God's love that he has for his children. He sings over them. 
He's so enamored by his people. He sings over them. A people for two and a half ch chapters that they had judgment because they had rebelled against God. They had run away from God. They had disobeyed God. And God is delighting in them to draw them to himself. I think probably the best picture of this, apart from my wife, but probably this is heretical, is in Scripture. And it's the, the prodigal father. And it says, the prodigal son arose and came to his father when he was destitute. He had nothing. He had squandered his inheritance that he had gotten from his father when he pretty much told his father he wanted him dead. And he walked that long route back home. And it said, the fathers saw him and felt compassion. And what did he do? He ran to him. And he kissed him. Can you imagine that moment when the father saw him and called his prodigal son home? The joy that he had. And the son had long scripted what he wanted to say. And father, I have sinned against you and against heaven before. I'm not worthy to be called his son. And the father says, of course you're not. But I love you so much. You're my son. And the father quickly called his servants and said, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened cat and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found and they begun to celebrate. They sung and they shouted and they exulted with all their heart because the father delighted in his son. Brothers and sisters, this is the heart of our Heavenly Father who knows the depth of our sin. He has felt the bitterness and the rejection of our rebellion against Him and the waywardness of our wanderings. Every day that prodigal father, bleed, his heart bled for his son and God our Father bleeds for His children as he weeps for what they have done to themselves. And he would be justified in punishing them. But we have a God, as our call to worship said, his gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And as we often sing, what love could remember, no wrongs we have done, omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their son, thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins they are many. His steadfast love and mercy and grace are more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy, his grace, and his compassionate love is more. Ocean Park, God delights in his people and he loves his people. He rejoices over his people. This is absolutely breathtaking. No matter circumstances, no matter the enemies we encountered, no matter our mistakes and our wanderings, God loves us. Not of anything in us, but because of everything in him. He delights in us so much that it says, but God shows his love towards us that while we were still sinners, while we were wayward, while we were rebelling, while we were committing cosmic treason against him, Christ died for us. And therefore, we can sing and we can shout and we can exult and rejoice with all our hearts because God is our midst, he is mighty to save, and he mightily loves us. His, the promise that we have of God's steadfast love in Christ is the beginning of eternal joy. And we have a future without fear. We have a God who cherishes us and we have a place where we can belong. I think deep down inside... We all want to be like Norm Peterson, right? Let me remind you who Norm Peterson is. 
Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everyone knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everyone knows your name. And when Norm would walk in the door, pretty much everywhere he went, people yelled out, Norm. And they knew Norm. And they knew his struggles. The longing of the human heart is a place to belong. And it's a place to belong with our Creator. As Augustine said, God has created us for Himself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. Where we belong with our Creator. I believe one of the greatest struggles of the 21st century, a uh, a century where we are more connected to one another than we've ever been before, in social media and email, and uh, uh, a uh, thing can happen in China, and three seconds later they know about it in the United States. It's that fast. We're that connected. We have never been more lonely. The... um, Survey Center of America just recently released a um, survey asking people the number of close friends they have, not counting their relatives. Every single category was down from where it was 30 years ago. In 1990, only 3% of men said they had no friends. In 2021, 10% of men said they had no friends. In 1990, 28% of women said they had 10 or more friends. In 2021, only 11% said they had more than 10 friends. This is a direct threat to our society. We are suffering in a silent exile by ourselves. But here's the promise that we have. The promise of the gospel in verses 18 and 19. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival. Those of you who have been isolated and banished and in exile because of sin so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with your oppressors. oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. I will change their shame into praise and renown on the earth. And that time... I will bring you in. And at that time, I will gather you together. I will make you renowned and praised among all the people of the earth when I restore your fortunes from you. There is a day when God will gather his people together to the place where they will belong. A place without tears and a place without condemnation. A place without oppression. A place without pain. A place without rejection and a place without shame. God will dwell with his people and they will be united with the family. We will feast as we're about to sing in the house of Zion and we will be long at the table. Instead, it will be a place where God's people belong. For God, the mighty warrior, loves them and gathers them to himself with his people. He will defeat every enemy. He will silence every accusation. He will vanquish every oppressor. He will destroy every barrier. He will wipe away every source of shame. Our Father's kingdom will be a place where his people belong. It will be home. We look forward to that day, and as John said, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This week marked the 10-year anniversary of a death of a dear friend of Denise and mine, and he was a strong believer, and he faced many struggles and disappointments and oppressions and heartaches through his life. But the promise of the gospel told him, and he believed that there was nothing that could separate him from the love of Christ. I sent a text to his family this week, praying for you all as you remember the wonderful gift of your dad's life, love, and legacy. I'm so thankful that he was my friend. I long to look, I long with hope to the day when Christ returns and your dad rises. Rises to eternal life. What a glorious reunion it will be in the new heavens and new earth, and we will be with the Lord. And I put this verse the promise of. No, that's not. It's, that's cheers. That's definitely not the promise of the gospel. That awkward moment when you quote cheers instead of the Bible. For the Lord himself 
will descend from heaven with a cry and a command and the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and though we who are alive we will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord as his heir and what will happen? We will always, we, the family of God in the place that we belong secured by our mighty warrior who loves us and cares for us and gathers him to himself we will always be with the lord ocean park we're going to face pain and tears and suffering in this life but it's not the end of the story in fact it is what god is using to detach our allegiances from this world and set our hearts towards home where christ is where we're loved and we're cherished and we're celebrated and no power on earth can threaten us and overcome us and change god's promise for he is mighty to save there war, we can sing and we can shout and we can rejoice with all our hearts because God is our midst. He is mighty to save. He loves us and he will bring us home. Let me, I haven't got there yet. The promise of God's steadfast love in Christ is the beginning, beginning of eternal joy. But like, like Judah... The condemnation for sin, the consequences of sin had not ha happened. They didn't get off the hook. The Assyrians came and they wiped the city out and the people went into exile, but God brought them home. And that was a picture of the greater day of the Lord when God will come and vanquish sin and bring his people to himself. And we don't always understand what God is doing when we look in a world that is broken by sin. We look at the cross, and at first it feels like the cross was defeat. When Jesus said, it is finished, it wasn't a cry of despair and defeat. It was a cry of victory. Because our God is mighty to save. And Jesus came to take away the condemnation that stood against us by taking it on himself. He cleared away our enemies by triumph over them on the cross. And he sends us his spirit. And he promises that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us as he reigns as king over all creation at the right hand of the Father. And he is coming home or coming back to bring us home. And this should cause us to shout and sing and rejoice with all our hearts. Though the people celebrated in August 24th, it wasn't until September 2nd, 1945, aboard the USS Missouri, that the war officially ended when General uh, Douglas MacArthur and the Japanese representatives signed the conditions of surrender. Up to that point, though our nation celebrated, there were skirmishes that broke out in the Pacific who did not believe the truth and had not heard the truth of the surrender. And battles were waged because they refused, though the war was over. The Axis forces had been defeated in both Europe and the Pacific, and our boys were coming home with singing, and shouting and rejoicing with all their hearts. So it is with us. God our Father, our Commander-in-Chief, has declared the victory. Christ the Son, our Captain, has accomplished the victory. The Holy, God the Holy Spirit, our Advocate, our guarantee that we will be a part of the victory and that we will be brought home. And we can face a future without fear because we have a God who cherishes us and a place to belong because the promise of God's steadfast love in Christ is the beginning of eternal joy. Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to the table this morning, we thank you for who you are and what you have done. 
You are a God who is mighty to save. You are a God who is sovereign over heaven and earth. But you are a God who is not detached from us. But you are a God who is near and you love and you cherish your people. And you are working in us and through us to accomplish uh, the victory that you won at the cross. And we trust you. Though we don't always understand, we know the promises that our future, uh, we have not to fear our future because you live. We have your love that is expressed most brilliantly at the, co- at the cross, redeeming us and preserving us by your spirits. And you will bring us home where we will feast at, in the house of Zion as we taste this bread this morning and drink of the cup It is a foretaste of that great feast that we will have when we get home. And we sit at your table with all our brothers and sisters who have gone before us faithfully trusting the promises of God in Christ. And we will always be with the Lord. And we find comfort in those words. In Christ's precious and holy name we pray. Amen.